us. And you fan that flame that from a burning coal to a small flame to a roaring fire till we are consumed by your holy fire. Let us be consumed by the presence of your holy fire, Lord. Let us be consumed, Lord, till nothing is left but your fire. Till nothing is left but the fire of your love. For our God is a consuming fire, and no flesh shall glory in his presence. Jesus, have your way. That you be glorified. That you speak your truth. That you speak your truth in love this morning. And that we are forever changed in Jesus' name. I'm going to try my best to hold it together. I probably won't. <laughs> but uh, the Lord told me to come prepared, so we're all good. <laughs> I brought a whole box, so we're good. <laughs> when you give a word from the Lord about salting the waters with your tears, Just as in the days of Elisha, the prophets, God's people, God's people that were the ones that were supposed to be leading and guiding Israel, were in Jericho, the condemned place, the place where they were told not to be. But it's good, they sold Elisha. But there's one problem, the waters are bitter. They make us sick when we drink the waters here. So Elisha said, bring me a new jar. This isn't even my... I trust you, Lord. Elisha said, bring me a new jar and salt. And then he went and put salt in the water. And it was cleansed and they could drink it. Church, we are the new vessel. Every single one of us is the new jar. And what I'm going to read today, I don't, even, I don't even really have a message. I have a story that I'm going to read today. And the Lord's going to talk to us through this story. It's the story of Abraham going to rescue Lot. And I was reminded this morning, in Oklahoma, I went to the small tent to the side at the very beginning on Friday night. There were four men praying. They were on their knees and their hands were raised, joined hands. And I wanted to join their prayer, but they were in covenant and I wasn't in that covenant, so I couldn't join their prayer, so I just went in the tent and prayed. And when they were done, they said, did you feel called by the Lord to this tent? And I said, yes. And they prophesied over me. And they said that uh, God had something special for me under the oak of Mamre. And I didn't think about that until this morning. The story begins under the oak of Mamre with Abraham. So I'm trusting that this is the word of the Lord for all of us today. As the prophet, I have to walk it out first. <laughs> when you are the preacher, when you are the teacher, when you are the one giving the word, you have to live it out first. And so, um, this is from a book, just, I, there's no source, there's no description, there's a reverend as an author, I don't know if this is a parable, I don't know if this is a fable, I don't know if this is Christian fiction, but it's called the Book of Melchizedek, and I thought I was bringing you a word this morning about the Book of Mel the Order of Melchizedek, which is something I've been working on for my, for my ministry, but I opened this up because I thought it was going to be about Melchizedek, but it starts with Abraham. And it's the story of how Abraham goes to rescue Lot. And I wept as I read this story. And so I don't know if this is one of the scrolls found in Quorum, one of the lost scrolls that has been found. This is a story. Um, this isn't scripture. This is a story. It doesn't, as, as Robin Bullock would say, doesn't bump up against scripture. It doesn't deny anything in the scripture, in the story we know from Genesis chapter 14. The Bible just tells us in Genesis 14 
that this is the war of the five kings versus the four. And this is right after Lot and Abraham separate. Um, Lot chooses the good land that is, looks good, it's flat, it's easy, it's flourishing for his flock. And Abram takes the harsher land. And right after they separate, Lot ends up captured as um, a prisoner um, when the five kings overthrow Sodom, the kings of Sodom and the other kings that were joined together. So we learn about this war in chapter 14, and this is just the story of Abraham's journey uh, and how the Lord dealt with him. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to read portions of this story. I'm going to summarize portions of the story. I don't even know how long it's going to take to get through this, but I'm just trusting that this is the word of the Lord today. Chapter 1. I was resting under the shade of the oak of Mambre by the tent when I saw one of my nephew Lot's servants arriving in haste. Almost out of breath, he began to tell me about the tragedy. The day before, there had been a battle between the cities of the plain, involving four kings against five. As a result, Sodom had been defeated and many of its inhabitants taken captive. Among them, my nephew Lot. The news left me very distressed, for at the same time as I felt that I would have to go out to their rescue, I saw myself frail, with no possibility of being victorious. I've always been a peaceful man, and I hate those who shed blood. I have many servants, but few know how to handle swords and spears, for since childhood they have been trained as shepherds. Instead of swords, they wield the stick with which they lead their flocks. Instead of shields, they carry vessels in their belts, always full of fresh water to quench their thirst and to cool the weary sheep. Instead of wine to get drunk, they carry small bottles of olive oil in their belts, with which they grease the wounds of the flock. Instead of snoring or loud trumpets, they blow small horns, with which they summon the flock to the, cor to the corral. Imagining what a battle would be like between my servants and the armies of those five victorious kings, I began to laugh. And while I was laughing, the voice of him who always guides me sounded in my ears, saying, Abraham, Abraham, do not despise the instruments of the shepherds, for they, sanctified by the fire of sacrifice, will conquer the great deliverance. The Eternal One began to give me orders, making me advance by faith without knowing so much as deliverance, as, as knowing how such a deliverance would be accomplished. The first step was to summon all the shepherds who, leaving their flocks, went to Car Carvela de Mambre, bringing their pastoral instruments. They were 600 shepherds in all. I ordered them to empty the jars, putting in them the oil from the bottle. After fulfilling this order, I asked them each to take the wool of a sheep, mixing it in with the oil from the jars. After transmitting all orders to the shepherds, the Eternal One spoke to me. Now take your vase, your only vase, and bring it to me so that I can show you what to do. We had in the tent three pitchers purchased in the city of Haran. In the two smallest, we kept the oil for the lamps. And in the third that was the biggest and the most beautiful, we kept pearls and precious stones, jewels gathered by Sarah along our pilgrimages. Thinking that the third jar was the chosen one, I stretched out my hands to take it, but the Lord prevented me from doing so, affirming that even though it was carried with riches that would be essential for deliverance, he had chosen a special jar, the one that had been rejected and forgotten. I remembered the great clay pitcher that had been given to us by a humble potter when we were near Canaan. We initially put it beside the three, and in it we put the first fruits harvested from the promised land. There being no beauty in him, however, Sarah rejected him, throwing him out of the tent. Seven years later, the potter visited us, and finding him abandoned by the tent, showed us a way in which he could be useful, this, this pot could be useful. Tying him tightly with a linen rope, he threw him into the bottom of the well. Through him, the shepherds began to draw water for their flocks. Following the guidelines of the Eternal, I went to the well, bringing out from its depths the forgotten pitcher, seeing it filled with water. I remembered the moment when it had been cast there, empty and dry. After emptying it, the Eternal One ordered me to transfer to him 
the oil of the two smallest jars, as well as the jewels of the third. As there was much empty space left in the jar, Eternal ordered it to be filled with new olive oil. At the end of this task, the Lord commanded me to make a long wick of wool, one of its ends to be dipped in the oil and the other suspended over the vase. After these things, the Eternal One commanded me to light the wick with the fire of the altar. As I approached the sacred fire, which was still burning over the morning sacrifice, a small spark leapt onto the wick, and little by little it fed on the oil until it became a flame which could be seen from afar. So the things that jumped out to me from chapter one, do not despise the instruments of the shepherds. Abraham, Abraham, do not despise the instruments of the shepherds, for they, sanctified by the fire of sacrifice, will conquer the great deliverance. God gives us exactly what we need, when we need it. God selected the cast out vessel, not the beautiful costly vessel, but the ugly, humble vessel that they didn't even want in the house. Instead, after someone showed them how it could be useful, I should say after the maker of the pot, after the maker of the pot showed them how this ugly pot could still be useful, they tied it to a rope and threw it into a well to draw water from the deep places in the well. It reached the bottom of the well. This was the vessel God declared his chosen and honored vessel to carry the oil and the costly pearls and the gems, the only vessel God deemed worthy to carry the flame of his presence. God gave Abraham the instructions on what to do and how to do it. Abraham still had to be obedient and do it exactly as he was commanded. Abraham's only job, his only work, was to do exactly what God said to do and showed him how to do it. But it was God that sent the spark from the holy fire consuming the morning sacrifice. It was God who lit the fire, and it is God who will keep that fire burning. Hear me. If God says to do something, just do it. He asks us to do the meaningless, the trivial, the foolish things. But when we will be obedient to do the foolish things, he does all the rest. If we are willing to use what we have before us as God commands, then God will do what is impossible for us. It is only a miracle if it is impossible for man, for with God all things are possible. Once the spark left the fire of God, once the wool wick was lit, it burned and it burned until it connected with the oil in the jar. And once it connected with the oil in the jar, the flame grew and grew until it was a great light that could be seen from far away. Friday night, the Lord put the picture in my heart of the two olive trees in Zechariah chapter 4. In the Amplified, it says, Then he said to me, This addition of the bowl to the candlestick, causing it to yield a ceaseless supply of oil from the olive tree, is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, of whom the oil is a symbol, says the Lord of hosts. When we connect our roots to the root of David, to the root of the one called the branch, we connect heaven to earth. But we must bear down and break through the hard soil in our hearts. That is the labor pains we are feeling. It is the pressing through the dry places. It is the pressing through and the pressing through the pain that we are feeling. It is the bride of Christ bearing down to push through and to break through the contractions of labor, to push through the pain, to push through the narrow way of the birth canal until we have borne the way. And so we have connected our roots with the branch, the vine, the way, the truth, and the life. This is the place where we enter the rest. For once this divine connection is made, it cannot be broken. Hear me. When the bride of Christ births the way, in Acts, what did they call them? They called themselves the way. The early church called themselves the way. When the bride of Christ births the way, and connects our root system with Jesus Christ, then our oil just flows. What did Jesus tell us? His burden is easy and his yoke is light. But you have to get through the birthing first. 
And that is what the five wise virgins understood. They had plumbed their hearts. They had cultivated a connection to the source of the oil. You can't buy that in a marketplace. You can't borrow it from a friend. Remember, both the foolish and the wise virgins were sleeping when the watchman called out the bridegroom's arrival. They were both sleeping. The wise had time to trim their wicks and get ready to feast in the presence of the bridegroom because they had already connected to the source of the oil. The foolish were left out because yesterday's oil isn't enough any longer. Yesterday's revelation, yesterday's revival, yesterday's prayers, yesterday's way of life, God isn't there any longer. And until we are ready to humble ourselves, until we are ready to bring our ugly, broken pots to the, to the Lord and give him our shame, give him our inexperience, give him our doubts and our fears, he is not able to give us directions on where to dig and what to dig with. God will tell us, now take your vase, your only vase, and bring it to me so that I can show you what to do. So in chapter 2, I, I should say, chapter, I, 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 I labeled these cute little names, right? I like to do that. And chapter 1 was the call. Abraham heard the call. Have you heard the call? Are you ready to move forward into the choice? Because after you get the call, chapter 2 is the choice. So Abraham chose to follow God and to be obedient. He sets out with the big, heavy vase of oil. This is larger than any other vase in his home. It carried everything that the other three had carried, plus more, the new olive oil. So Abraham sets out with this heavy vase of oil carried on his shoulder with the flame of the Eternal One burning bright. He sets out with 600 of his trusted shepherds. And what comes next? The mockers. And those who would try to steal his lamp. The mockers, the liars, and the thieves. Who does that sound like? You're crazy. Who needs a lamp during the daylight? Why are you carrying around a lamp during the day? You are insane. Ashamed, many of the shepherds fell away and returned home. Many fell away when the mockers came and, the, and, the, and those came that tried to steal. Rather than rising up and trying to protect Abraham and joining together, many fell away in shame. They couldn't, they couldn't understand. They, did, they didn't have the faith to keep going. They didn't believe where they were going and why. They didn't, they didn't have the connection Abraham had to the purpose. This was Abraham's nephew Lot he was going to rescue. This is a rescue mission. This whole thing is a rescue mission. And they didn't see the purpose. They didn't understand the value of the mission. And they fell away. Even Sarah gave Abraham no comfort or encouragement. It got worse and it got worse until this burden fell to Abraham alone. He was walking alone, carrying this heavy jar. He was becoming physically weary from carrying this heavy burden. He was becoming discouraged because of all the negativity and naysayers all around him. Even people he could usually count on to encourage him in his faith. They mocked him. They left him. What do you th who do you think you are, Abraham? You fool carrying around a heavy lamp all day long. You don't even know where you're going. Do you even know where you're going? You don't even know where you're going. You're just wandering. And you think that you're going to take on an army of five kings and be victorious? Ha! Madness. Sheer madness. You're crazy. Very quickly, what had been a symbol of God's presence and glory had become a symbol of shame, disgrace, and contempt. Sarah came, at the end of chapter 2, Sarah came to Abraham and begged him to drop the lamp and just run away with her. Let's just go somewhere else where they haven't seen and heard of our shame, where they don't know that you're crazy, Abraham. Just forget it. This can't be God's plan. It shouldn't be this hard. This can't be God's plan. Leave. Let's go to another country. We'll just start over somewhere. Let's just move somewhere else where nobody knows us, right? That's the answer. Or in today's language, let's go where someone else has it going on and let's, let's, let's join in their oil. Let's use their oil, right? Let's go to that ministry. Let's go here. Let's go there. Rather than plumb where God has placed us, rather than to go in the hard places where God has put us, let's go over there where it looks easy, where they've already got the oil flowing. Let's go somewhere where there's no shame and they don't know of our foolishness. 
chapter 3, the revelation. Abraham chose to continue on his journey alone, anguished that he could not please his wife. He just kept walking as the flame guided him along the way. As he continued to walk, Abraham began to see his past service as high priest unto the Lord in a whole new light. He'd always been a steward of the flame at the altar of the Lord before all of the other shepherds. He was the one, right? He was their leader. He was the shepherd of shepherds. They were his people. He had been favored. He had, he had been the favored chosen one of the Lord. He'd put on his best garments and put on quite a show as he offered the sacrifices to the Lord. With a loud voice and a dramatic swing of his sword, he slayed the lamb on the altar. And Abraham realized his dramatics represented before the shepherds an image of a severe God who is always ready to fight back any affront. To show the divine wrath, I would step upon the neck and strike her severely until I saw her perish. He's talking about how he would slay the lamb on the altar. To show the divine wrath, I would step upon her neck and strike her severely until I saw her perish. Then I would descend from the altar and wait for the sacred fire that never ceased to manifest itself on the sacrifice. Abraham says, I had learned from childhood to revere the sacred fire, believing it to be a visible revelation of the eternal, the great invisible God. Until then, I had seen him as unique and indivisible fire. But now, as I carried in a humble jar the flame that had been released from the altar, my thoughts were stirred with the appearance of a new concept about the Creator, the concept of a suffering God who is capable of detaching himself from the great being represented by the fire to accompany the sinner on his journey. I was sorry. I prostrated myself before the jug and cried bitterly. I was aware that all the zeal shown at the altar was for exaltation of my pride and not for the love of the one who accompanied me on my way. Suddenly the conviction was engraved in my mind that the little flame that had been released from the sacred fire was a representation of the promised Messiah who would detach himself from the eternal in order to be God with us, companion in all our journeys. When this conviction came to me, the flame rejoiced, burning brighter and warmer. With a transformed heart, I continued on my way to the valley, carrying on my shoulder the jar that had brought me after so much contempt, the joy of a new understanding about the character of the Creator. It's right after this difficult moment in the walks Excuse me, right after this, difficult moments in Abraham's walk came. Right after this revelation came, the cold winds from the Dead Sea blew, trying to extinguish the flame that he was carrying. Abraham protected the flame with his body, turning this way and that, walking backwards and sideways to protect and to shield the flame with his body. This was a difficult journey all through the rest of the night. But when the daylight broke, Abraham found himself one step away from the plane that was his destination. Oh, friends, we have got to keep going. When the winds howl and are trying to extinguish your flame, you have got to keep going. Turn, walk sideways, walk backwards, but keep moving towards the mark. Keep going. You are one step. Who knows if you are one step away from your destination? And as he walked, he met other shepherds. Now he, he's entering the plain, right? In the morning it rose, and he's right there, one step away from the plain. So now as he walks through the plain, this light is, is drawing confusion and turmoil. It's causing riots. The shepherds are getting angry. The sheep are, are disheartened and, and scurrying. And it's causing all this commotion, this flame. It scared the sheep. But Abraham just kept going. He just ignored it. He just kept on moving toward, in his journey towards Sodom, towards his nephew, towards his purpose to rescue his nephew Lot. And then something very odd happened. Little sheep, gentle and submissive, began to follow Abraham as he carried the flame. Just a few at first until there were so many that Abraham could barely walk because he was surrounded by so many of these precious little sheep. Abraham could see the angry shepherds in the distance, infuriated at the loss of their beautiful sheep. 
but he just kept going. Then Lot arrived in Sodom. It was empty and it was devastated. He arrived where he thought he was going and the, and the destruction was great. So he followed the trail the soldiers had left into the plain of, the plain of Dan. Can you imagine what that trail looked like? Destruction, fire, brokenness, blood everywhere. Probably bodies strewn everywhere. But he followed the trail of misery into the plain of Dan. And there Abraham could see the camp of the soldiers at the foot of the hill. From the top of the hill looking down, Abraham could see the whole camp of soldiers. There were thousands celebrating their victory with hundreds of captives lying crowded in the middle of the camp, humiliated and hopeless. Abraham wondered how the liberation would be given. Notice his heart posture. How would liberation be given? He still believed God would deliver a lot. He still believed God had sent him on a rescue mission and that God would achieve the mission. He just wondered how. How, God? Then the soldiers noticed Abraham's presence. How peculiar, this man carrying a smoking pot. When they asked why he was there, Abraham told them, I'm here to free my nephew Lot, one of your prisoners. Ha! Here we go again. They laughed, they mocked, they scorned. The, the soldiers roared with laughter. But soon the mocking turned to cries for vengeance, a thirst for blood. And they declared, the soldiers declared, that the very next morning all of the captives would be exterminated, beginning with Lot. Chapter 4, the rescue. I'm going to read all of chapter 4. While I was trying to imagine what the Eternal One could do to achieve liberation, I saw shepherds coming towards me from Sodom in the distance. I thought at first that it was the enemy shepherds who came to tear away my lovingly conquered flock. This fear soon disappeared, giving way to a feeling of great joy when I discovered that they were my faithful shepherds. They came together in a small group of 12 until they reached the total of 300. They came together in a small group of 12 until they reached the total of 300 shepherds. As I looked at them, I could see in their countenance the signs of a great spiritual struggle that they had to face in order to be on my side. They told me of the experience of many companions who, discouraged, had thrown away the oil and the wool from their vessels and returned to their tents. They told me how the night before they had learned the lo to love the light of my jar, which for them had become like a star guiding them in the darkness. I rejoiced at the presence of my humble shepherds when they came towards us. And our Escol and Nantman Manre, accompanied by 15 armed men, they were faithful friends who, knowing the dangers that would face in that valley, came to our aid so that they would not interfere with the divine plan because they were not part of Abraham's tribe. They weren't born and raised in Abraham's camp. I asked them to remain hidden until dawn when they would receive guidance on how to participate in the mission. I began to guide the shepherds following the instructions of the divine voice that surrounded from within the flame, that sounded from within the flame. The first task of the shepherds would be to care for the flock until nightfall. On their return, I ordered them to tie the woolen balls soaked in oil to the tip of their sticks placing them inside the jars that were to be kept hanging from their mouths. I set them on fire with the fire of my flame until the 300 torches were burning, but hidden inside those vases. I ordered 40 of my brave shepherds who, at the moment indicated by a sign, were to move silently into the middle of the camp, surrounding all the captives who were lying piled up in the middle of the camp. At the same time, the remaining 260 shepherds were to circle the entire camp, waiting for the sign to break the pots with their horns. Guided by the voice of the flame, I indicated the signs to them that the last torch, that when the last torch went out in the camp, they should be attentive because a small lamp would be lit by one of the captives. As soon as the lamp started burning, they should each run to their place 
avoiding any noise so that they should not be noticed. The signal to break the pots with their horns, raising the torch very high, was to put out the lamp. So when the lamp went out, that was the sign. After these orientations, the 260 shepherds, hidden in the shadows of the night, spread out in the valley and waited for the moment to position themselves around the camp. Meanwhile, the 40 positioned themselves near a vulnerable passage through which they would reach the captives. It was already high night when the torch of the last soldier went out, with complete darkness and silence over the camp. Among the captives, there was a man who that night experienced the greatest anguish of his life. It was my nephew, who after being the target of so many abuses and humiliations, had become aware of the punishment that awaited them at dawn. That night, Lot had his thoughts turned to his uncle. He remembered with regret the moment he had left me, moving to the plains of Sodom. In his desperation, he felt the desire to see my face again and to ask forgiveness for having turned away from me. At that very moment, Lot was attracted to the glow of a torch burning on the hill. As he stared at the glow, he imagined he was having a vision, for it revealed to him the face of his dear uncle. Wanting to show me his face, Lot groped in the darkness until he found a little lamp that he had brought in his saddlebag. Frustrated, he realized there was no oil in it. He concluded that the lamp out and dry was a symbol of his empty and faithless life. Without averting his eyes from my face, lit by the flame of the jar, in a desperate gesture of faith, Lot touched the wick of his lamp, discovering in it a residue of oil. Bowing down, he, ba Bowing down, he began to wound the stones of the fire until a spark jumped into the wick. Without his knowing it, Lot was commanding with his gestures the steps to a great deliverance. The 300 shepherds, seeing the tenuous glow of the lamp, quickly made their way to their posts and waited for the little flame to go out. From the moment Lot rose up with his tiny flame, I kept looking into their eyes that stared at mine. I saw that his face showed signs of unspeakable anguish and mistreatment. Yet I could read in his eyes that hope and faith had not yet abandoned him. The little fire of his lamp, however, would not endure for long. It was necessary to put out to signal the great victory. When darkness covered the face of Lot again, my 300 shepherds threw their horns at the vessels that kept the burning torches hidden. A loud noise, as of a cavalry in battle, echoed everywhere. While the torches were suspended by the sticks, the 300 horns used until then to lead the flock now sounded like the trumpets of conquerors. The whole camp awoke in a single leap, and not knowing how to escape such a terrible onslaught from outside and inside, the soldiers began to fight amongst themselves, while my shepherds remained in their places, sounding their horns. The captives were very astonished at first, but little by little they became aware of the great deliverance that was operating in their favor. When it dawned, a, scen a scenario of complete destruction revealed itself to our eyes. When the sun rose... Complete destruction revealed itself to our eyes. The whole camp was covered with thousands of bodies torn by their own swords and spears. Only a few managed to escape from the death camp. But they were pursued by my 18 allies who were armed, being reached in, Ho in Hobah, situated to the left of Damascus. Meanwhile, the captives, now freed, recovered all the riches that had been plundered by their enemies. Abraham was still trying to figure out what God could do to pull off this rescue mission. As he was imagining, he saw shepherds coming towards him. Uh-oh, he thought they were coming for the sheep. But then he noticed it was his faithful shepherds coming to join him. He started with 600, but he ended up with 300. Who else in the Bible ended up with 300? And who else used the same exact plot and plan to, de to defeat the enemy? It was Gideon. And hasn't it been prophesied right now that we are in the days of Gideon? The weaning down from the 600 now to the 300. And at first 12, it all started with 12 disciples. It all started with 12 disciples, and it grew. God is revealing his plan. 
He can turn your staff into a torch. He can turn your hiding places in the appointed hour to the revealing places for the battle plan. When they would use their small ram's horns to break the vessel, something spectacular happened. These little ram's horns, people like to blow the big shofars because these, don't, these, aren't, these aren't as amazing sounding. They sound, they, they sound squawky, they sound weak. But these are the little horns that God says are my battle cries. These are the horns that break the vessels and loose the fire of God. Then there would be a small light down by the prisoners. The 40 shepherds surrounded the prisoners and the 260 waited for the appointed hour. 40 is the number of trial and testing. It's 40 days and 40 nights that Jesus fasted in the wilderness. It's 40 days and 40 nights for trials and testing. If it's an attack of the enemy, it can only last three days, but if you are in the wilderness called by God, it's a 40 day process. It's a 40 day process until you get to come out and see the victory. Lot thought he was repenting and asking forgiveness. He thought that he had missed it. He thought that he had missed it all and messed it all up. But in him humbling himself and making his final prayers to God before what he thought was his death, that is exactly what God used as the sign to start the deliverance, the sign to start the rescue mission. When we will humble ourselves, when we will grab for our lamp and know that there's just a residue of the oil left, just a residue of the presence of God left in our lives, but when we will try to light it anyway, God provides the spark. Lot had only a little oil left in his lamp, but he had unknowingly giving, given the signal for his rescue mission to commence. Church, when Abraham looked at his nephew, he could see in his face the signs of unspeakable anguish and mistreatment. Yet I could read in his eyes that hope and faith had not abandoned him. How many people have been ab abandoned by the church, have been rejected by the church, or have left wounded by the church? But there is still a spark of hope and faith in them if we will have eyes to see and ears to hear. God, illuminate those people to us that need to be rescued. I pray, Lord, that our loved ones, our children and our grandchildren still have that spark of hope and faith in their eyes. That all those uh, prodigal sons who have left and gone to seek the things of the world still have hope and faith, a spark of hope and faith left in their eyes. And show us the rescue mission, Lord. Before it's too late, Lord, while there's still time, show us your purpose and your plan for the rescue mission. It is your will that none should perish. It's not us, Lord. Send out the shepherds to find the one, if not us. Send out the shepherds to find the one. Send out the shepherds to draw them into your flocks, if not our flock. Send another shepherd to draw them into your flock. And the victory will be yours. The honor and the glory for victory is all yours, Lord. Using sticks and vessels and fire and horns, who can take credit for that victory but God? With the shepherds whose greatest weapon was a stick lit like a match and a ram's horn used to call their sheep, they defeated an army of thousands. Use what you have. Trust that the Lord has given you the gifts and the abilities and the tools necessary for you to carry out the rescue mission that he has set before you. God doesn't need you to fight his battles. God needs you to be Christ-like. This is my personal revelation for this hour. God doesn't need me to fight his battles. He needs me to be Christ-like and to break my vessel and let the light shine. Our highest calling is to be like Jesus Christ. And these are the times and the seasons when the Lord will call you to warfare, but only when it's the enemy blocking your path to Christ-likeness. Not to fight for anything else but Christ-likeness. I'm done talking about warfare. I'm done talking about the devil. I'm done talking about all of the crap going on in this world. I am revealing the light of Jesus Christ. I am breaking open my vessel and revealing the light of Jesus Christ because when your light shines, the enemy flees. 
The darkness is a shadow. It has no power. When you will break your vessel and reveal your light, the enemy flees. And Jesus is our example. The greatest victory ever won was accomplished by Jesus Christ laying down his life as a living sacrifice to atone for the sins of all mankind, past, present, and future. Without a single word of rebuke to Satan, without a sword, without a shield, without any weapon other than the Lamb of God laying down his life on the altar of mankind's sin. Jesus defeated death, hell, and the grave and restored man to his rightful place at the right hand of our Father, reconciled. He paid the ransom for our Father and us to be one and for us to rule and reign as co-heirs in Christ Jesus. Jesus' only battle with Satan occurred after 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Remember last week, Nathan taught us that the wilderness is part of the promised land. It is where we go to hear the voice of God speak his purpose and his plans. Just like Abraham, it is where he reveals the plans for the rescue mission. He will reveal, you don't even know where you're going. You just know God said, go over here, go do this, go over here. You don't know where you're going. It feels like a dry place. It feels like a narrow place. It feels hard. It feels like this can't be your plan. Why is this so hard? Just like Abraham, we must be willing to go to the wilderness to receive God's master plan. And then when we come out, we can tell Satan the same thing, Jesus. Get behind me. That's the only thing you need to tell Satan. Get behind me. And it was on Abraham's journey through the wilderness that Abraham received the revelation that would change history forever. And it was Jesus' journey in the wilderness where Jesus received the plan of the ultimate rescue mission for all mankind. He received a revelation of how to defeat death, hell, and the grave, and that changed history forever. Do we think our journey will be any different? They both were met with adversity the minute they left the wilderness to go execute the plan. Do not be surprised by the fiery trial that is before you. Immediately they were met with adversity, but they both had a choice to make, so make the choice to trust God. Trust God's plan. No matter what it costs you, no matter what it costs them, they didn't turn back. Don't turn back. Keep moving forward, one step at a time, backwards if you must. They chose to trust God. Abraham had to go first. It is right after this happens that he receives the blessing from Melchizedek to become the next high priest or the next king of righteousness. Right after this is when Melchizedek comes with the, wine and the, with the bread and the wine and blesses him and passes the torch unto Abraham to be the next king of righteousness, to carry on the order. And it's right after this that Jesus makes the covenant with Abram. It's right after this that the promise is made that Isaac will come. It's right after this that God calls Isaac, God calls Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac so that the covenant can be established in the world. The, the imprint can be made so that Jesus can send, so that Jesus can come. It was 30 years later that God called Abraham to a place that he would show him in the mountain to offer Isaac, his only begotten son, as a burnt offering unto the Lord. 30 years. We have 30 years till we're called to that same place of sacrifice. We have 30 years. You see, if Abraham hadn't been willing to go rescue Lot, the revelation of Messiah would not have come. And without the revelation of Messiah, Abraham would not have received Isaac and would not have been willing to offer Isaac as the sacrifice. By fulfilling his end of the covenant, Abraham opened up the way for Jesus, the promised Messiah, to come. Church, we are in the last days. Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back soon. What is the Lord calling you to do? What is God telling, who is God telling you to go rescue? Are you asking him? Who? It's not what, it's, people, what is my purpose? What is my purpose? Your purpose is to rescue as many as you can before the end of the age. That is every single believer's purpose right now. 
to rescue as many as you can, to tell as many as you can about the love of Jesus Christ. That is your purpose. Are you willing to go on the journey no matter what it costs you? No matter who it costs you? What relationships it costs you? What pride and humility it costs you? Humiliation it costs you? No matter how foolish things look on the outside, no matter how mad you look, will you just trust God has spoken to you and will you obey when he speaks? We were chosen to be in this last age. Just as Tim said, we were chosen for such a time as this. We have been handpicked by God to participate in preparing the way for the return of Jesus Christ. Are we willing to lay down our life to go after the one who was lost from the 99? Are we willing to be a church in obscurity? A church that has what? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of us here today. There's seven people here today. Are we willing to live in obscurity to go rescue the one? To go rescue the one. If this church rescues one person from this world, then we have served our purpose. When your spouse or your family don't understand, when people call you crazy, are you still willing to go all in and set out to where you do not know? See, this story happened the week of Yom Kippur. Chapter 5 is the atonement. This deliverance, which has come to pass today, represents the deliverance that I will work in the last day, saving the remnant of your children from the siege of numerous nations that will ally themselves with Gog for the purpose of destroying them. In that day when they shall triumph over my people, my wrath shall be very great, and I will contend with them through pestilence, fire, and blood, and flooding rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstones will I cause to fall upon them, upon their troops, and upon the many people who are with them. Thus will I magnify myself and vindicate my holiness and make myself known in the sight of many nations. And they shall know that I am the Lord. And upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, I will pour out the spirit of grace and supplications. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for me as one mourneth for the only begotten. And they shall weep for me as one bitterly weeps for the firstborn. In that day there shall be an open fountain for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem to remove sin and impurity. God is inviting us into his rescue mission. We have one last chance to save the remnants of Abraham's children from the siege of the numerous nations. Upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, I will pour out my spirit of grace and supplications. And in that day, says the Lord, there shall be an open fountain for the house of David and for the inhabitations of Jerusalem to remove sin and impurity, for he is coming for a bride without spot and without blemish. Yom Kippur is this Thursday, September 16th. May we choose to bathe in the fountain of God's goodness and ask forgiveness. A fountain is a place of cleansing, purification, and refreshing. The water represents faith, salvation, and provision. The Bible tells us we are to wa be washed by the water of God's word. Water is the source of all life. Ephesians 5, 25 through 26 talks about husbands and wives. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word. Church, Jesus is making his bride holy. Church, he's making his bride holy. I pray that we make it to the end. I pray that we don't give up through the, through the hard journey, through the hard places. I pray that we have the faith to stand. See, we don't have to do this comfortless. We don't have to do this on our own. Because when Jesus left, he sent back a comforter. In John 14, 16 through 18, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. 
I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Church, the world is never going to receive the spirit of truth. We have got to stop trying to change the world and start looking for who needs to be rescued out of the world. We are kingdom people. We are kingdom people sent from, be, to be ambassadors of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ in, in this world, not of this world. We are not to be influencers of the world. We are to be in this world to rescue people out of this world and put them into the kingdom of God where they can receive the spirit of truth. We cannot argue our way into revival. We cannot argue our way into people's hearts. The spirit of the Lord must soften the hearts of people. So open your eyes to see in your day whose heart is ready to receive the love of Jesus Christ. Whose heart is ready to receive truth. There is a promise for us in these last days. Jesus. I'm gonna read I'm gonna read Second Peter chapter three, and I'm gonna read it in the Tree of Life translation, which is a Messianic Jewish translation that I just found out about and I'm in love with right now. This is from a Hebrew Jewish believer's perspective of the scriptures. It's called the Tree of Life translation. And it says, The day of the Lord is coming. Loved ones, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you. In both, I'm trying to stir you up by way of a reminder to wholesome thinking to remember the words previously proclaimed by the holy prophets and the commandments of our Lord and Savior through your emissaries. First of all, understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing, following after their own desires and saying, where is this promise of his coming? Ever since the father died, everything goes on just as it has from the beginning of creation. For in holding to this idea, it escapes their notice that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. Through these, the world of that time was destroyed by being flooded with water. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly people. But don't forget this one thing, loved ones, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some consider slowness. Rather, he is being patient towards you, not wanting any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On the day, the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will melt and disintegrate, and the earth and everything done on it shall be exposed. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Live your lives in holiness and godliness. Be Christ-like is what he's saying. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. In that day, the heavens will be dissolved by fire and the elements will melt in the intense heat. But in keeping with his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And Peter calls this his final advice. Therefore, loved ones, while you are looking for these things, Make every effort to be found in shalom. Make every effort to be found in God's perfect peace, spotless and blameless before him, washed by the water of the word, right? Bear in mind that the patience of our Lord means salvation, just as our dearly beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom given to him. He speaks about these matters in all of his letters. Some things in them are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twit also excuse me, as they also do with the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Since you already know all of this, loved ones, be on your guard so that you are not led astray by the errors of the lawless and lose your sure footing. Instead, keep growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. We are called to be stewards of the flame. Every one of us are called to be stewards of the flame. Just as Abraham had to be a steward of that flame, that flame now lives in us 
and on us and through us. That comforter has come to light us up. I sent Tammy a prayer this morning, and I'm just going to read it. I feel like this is for Tammy. This is for everybody. Father, you are the creator of all that is good. You are the author and finisher of our faith. You are the creator and author of all that I am, of all that we are. You are the one true God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the God of Jew and Gentile. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been accepted once again into your bosom, into your loving embrace. Now I ask you to send your comforter to every shepherd of your flame. Send the comforter now when they need it most, when they're battling their solo journey through the wilderness. Bring their feet to the open plains by morning, and may they all show up at your appointed hour for the great battle that changes everything. Into your hands, into your machine, I commend my spirit And I lay down this flesh, and I pick up my cross, and I follow you. May your will be done, Lord, on earth as it is in heaven. Let heaven come in Jesus' name. I bless you, and the Lord keep you. May his grace shine upon you and be gracious to you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.